On March 10, 1928, Walter Collins was going to see a movie. When he didn't come home, his mother immediately called the police. It took the police five days to even start looking for Walter. After five months, they found the boy in Illinois. But when he was returned to his mother, she told the police, this is not my son. So what happened next? They put her in a mental institution. Yeah. But then they slowly realized that Walter Collins had been a victim of one of the worst serial killers in California history. Today, we are talking about the Wineville Chicken Coop murders. <music> Hello, my silky friends. It's Sunday and it's story time. This is going to be a long one, so let's jump right in. Today's tea is coffee. Yeah, we're grabbing the coffee cup because you're going to need a strong brew to get through this one. Today's hat. I tried to pick a hat that was as close to the 1920s as I could get. So what do you think? It's not the usual. So let's go back to the beginning and talk about Walter's parents. Christine Dunn was born in 1888 in Los Angeles. There's not a whole lot known about her early life. As she got older, she meets a guy named Walter Anson. Now, because he's an ex-convict, he is going by the name of Walter Collins. They get married and they have a son. Now, somewhere in between his birth and this period of time in 1928, Walter Sr., is, you know, an upstanding citizen, and he gets involved in another armed robbery and is sent to prison, where it is said he made several enemies. So where does that leave Christine? Well, she has to be the sole provider, take care of her son, so she gets a job as a telephone operator in LA. And though it was a great job as far as providing for her family, she had to work a lot of hours. So one Saturday in March, as she was working, Walter, not having school, asked her if he could go to the movies. So she gives him money, and she expects that he's going to be home when she gets there. Well, she gets home, no Walter. So she, you know, begins doing what any mother would do and go to the neighbors and kind of just, you know, see, have you seen Walter? Checks out the friends that he usually plays with, looks around for a couple of hours because... You know, you're not thinking the worst. This is the 1920s. So finally that evening, when she cannot find Walter, she calls the police. And the police are like, ah, we're not going to look for him right now. He's just out with somebody. Boys will be boys. You know, they really kind of didn't take it seriously. So Christine is looking for Walter for five days. Yeah, it took the police five days. And so after five days, when the police were convinced he wasn't just, you know, running off with friends or whatever, they finally decide to look for him. Now, because his father had ties to some, you know, shady people, they assumed that if Walter was taken, it actually had to do with his father's enemies, which really doesn't make sense. But, you know, what did they know in the 20s? But all efforts are fruitless. Now, at this time, Los Angeles was notorious for crime, and they were notoriously corrupt. A few months prior to Walter's disappearance, a little girl had gone missing, and then she was later found murdered. They had not caught her killer yet, and the citizens of L.A. were pretty disturbed about this. They were upset with the PD. So when Walter goes missing, also, it is a big deal, okay? It hits all the papers in Los Angeles, and from there, it is picked up throughout the whole country. Months go by. Finally, in August, which is five months later, the police call Christine and say, hey, we have found your son. He is actually in Illinois in the company of a drifter. You know, he's a runaway, but we found him. Now, I mean, that was great news. Christine was really excited and, and happy, like the whole city of Los Angeles. Now, here's the thing. The transportation from Illinois to California was quite pricey. Well, the LAPD were not going to pay for that. 
So it took Christine several weeks to save up enough money that the cost of a ticket was somewhere between $60 and $70. So Christine has to come up with it. So in the meantime, she has spoken to Walter a couple of times on the phone briefly, and they have written some letters back and forth, but no real contact. Finally, she has the money, and they send Walter back on the train. Well, when he comes back to L.A., of course, the, you know, press is there, and, you know, people are just clamoring to see this reunion that's making everybody so happy. So Walter gets off the train, and Christine is a little bit unsettled. He favors Walter, and true, she hasn't seen him in five months, and he's, you know, probably changed some. He just doesn't seem like the same Walter. So they go ahead and take the pictures and, you know, report this in the paper. And when she expresses her concerns to the police, what they say is, well, we think you're mistaken. Just take the boy and try him out for a while. Like, who tries out a child? What the heck? But anyway, that's what she did. Now, when she gets Walter home, she realizes even more and more this child does not act like Walter. He doesn't look exactly the same, and he is at least one inch shorter than Walter Collins, because every week Christine would measure him on the door frame, and this Walter was shorter. And the police just said, well, you know, he's been out, he's been without food, and kind of just, you know, scraping by, so, you know, he's going to be different. Yeah, you don't shrink, okay? In five months, a nine-year-old is going to grow, if anything. But whatever. Also, Walter's personality has drastically changed. Like, he used to be respectful. He used to be kind of quiet uh, boy. And he used to always call Christine mother. This boy was anything but. Now, he's rambunctious, he's disrespectful, and he calls her ma. She's just not feeling it. And she's convinced this boy is not her son. So she goes to the school and the teachers. And the teachers, you know, because it was during the school year, the teachers tell Christine they don't think it's Walter either. Like, they've had this kid in school for years. And now, this Walter, not the same. She goes to the police again and she keeps saying, this boy is not my son. Like, you have made a mistake. Well. The police, they were not having it because this had been a big success and now they were kind of redeeming themselves a little bit in the public eye. Now, Captain J.J. Jones of the LAPD was particularly hard on Christine. When she would voice her complaints over and over saying that Walter was not her son, he started demeaning her and telling her she was just shirking her responsibility, that she just wanted to go out and have fun, and she didn't want to be a mother anymore, and, you know, what was she doing, trying to make the state pay for this child now? And, you know, she's genuinely concerned because she knows that as long as she has this Walter, they are not looking for her son. Well, they didn't believe her. This goes back and forth. Finally, she goes to the dentist, and she asks to have this Walter's dental records compared with the other Walter. Dental records show that this boy is not her son. So here she is. She goes to the police with this proof um, of height and teacher's testimonies and the dental records, and they do their own tests. They were very scientific. Okay, now this boy has been living there with Christine in the house for about three weeks to a month, somewhere in there. The police decide their tests are to take Walter's dog and put him in another room and then open the door and see if the dog runs to Walter and recognizes him. And the dog does. Jeez. I mean, of course the dog does. He's been living with you for three weeks. He's not stupid. Apparently, the dog has more sense than you do, LAPD. But I digress. The other test is they took Walter to the edge of town, and they said if he can walk home, you know, and find his house, then obviously this is Walter. Again, this child has been living in this house for almost a month. 
But this is way more scientific than dental records, right? Give me a break. Anyway, Christine will not let up. This is not her son. And she becomes such a problem to the community and her outcry as she keeps telling reporters and telling people, okay, this is not my son, that the police decide they need to take action because she is making them look bad. Well, back at this time, you have to remember culturally, women were basically ho uh, homemakers. You know, they still weren't important in society. Although some worked, they were still the delicate ones, you know, a little bit emotional, a little bit hysterical. They were about to find out how much moxie Christine Collins had. So at this time, the police had a way to deal with these kind of women. They were loud. If they knew things that the LAPD was doing that was shady or illegal, and they tried to speak out about it, any kind of problem this woman gave the police, they would have them picked up on a code 12, which was basically saying, we need this person out of society. We need you to shut her up. And they were packed off to a mental institution. Yeah, I cannot imagine how many code 12s I would have had if I had lived in the 1920s, but that's just me. So Christine is taken to the mental institution where she is subjected to medical treatment she does not need, forced to take drugs that she does not need, all trying to break her spirit, but she will not give up. She keeps saying that Walter, this boy Walter, is not her son. So I am not sure where the new Walter was staying during this time, but somewhere in the middle of Christine being in the institution, Walter confesses, guys, you know what? I'm not Walter Collins. You're kidding me, right? Shocker. He says he is a boy named Arthur Hutchins. Now, Arthur Hutchins was from Iowa. He had ran away from his home because his mom had died a few years prior and his dad had remarried. And he could not get along with his stepmother. Like, he, ugh, he couldn't stand her. So, he just packs up and leaves one day. Well, he manages somehow to get into Illinois, where someone at a diner, you know, is looking at the paper, and they are seeing this picture of Walter Collins, and they tell this kid, hey, you know what? You look like this boy. And so, Arthur gets a bright idea. Now, if he says he's Walter Collins, he gets a free ticket to California, right? And that's exactly what he did. There's not a whole lot known about him, except that obviously he was a free spirit. Now, even though he was shorter than Walter Collins, he was 12 years old, not nine. And he was excited to go to California. He wanted to be in the movies. He wanted to meet Tom Mix, who was a cowboy actor at that time. Well, I mean, at 12, what can you say? He, he was an opportunist, yes, but he was a kid. And I am sure he did not realize all the problem that he was going to cause. After he confesses to the police that he is not Walter Collins, the police still take 10 days to release Christine. Good job, LAPD. Now, during the midst of all this, there was a Presbyterian minister called Gustav Rigleb. I don't know if I'm saying that right, y'all. I'm, I'm probably murdering it. Anyway, he had a radio program, and he was constantly trying to out the LAPD for all their crime, and he would just blast them. Well, when he got a hold of the story of Christine Collins, I mean, it just blew up. Now, this made the LAPD look really, really bad. Now, Christine is out of the mental institution, and then she is telling the police, I still don't have my son. Look for my son. But something was about to happen that would blow this case wide open and would cause one of the biggest scandals ever in California history. And they got a lot of history. Okay, during this time, you know, the LAPD, of course, there was, crime was running rampant, so they were pretty busy. Now, they get a report of this illegal alien boy working on a farm in Wineville, which was outside of L.A. And, you know, they didn't just run. I mean, it's an illegal situation. I mean, it's not like murder. 
Eventually, they get around to sending someone up to Wineville to kind of check out who's this kid. His the relatives are calling from Canada saying, hey, this boy is here illegally. We want him sent back. So they take a ride out to Wineville. Now, when they get to this chicken farm, they immediately find the illegal boy. His name was Sanford Clark, and he was at this time about 15. So they're asking, okay, Mr. Clark, where are your guardians? Like, who runs this farm and where are they? And he said, oh, they're out. They'll be back in a little while. But he's very, very nervous, and he's acting a little bit shady. And the police have a suspicion that something else is going on. So the police are actually at the house for about two hours and they're sitting in the house with Sanford and he's asking them kind of bizarre questions, just wasting their time basically. The officers have about had it and they start getting antsy and Sanford is getting even more upset. Finally, Sanford breaks down and he says, can you keep me safe? We're the police. Of course we can keep you safe. And that is when Sanford Clark tells the officers the most horrifying story they have ever heard. So let's go back to the beginning of the story of the Wineville Chicken Farm. Now this farm was owned by a man named Gordon Northcutt. He was born in 1906 in Saskatchewan, Canada to Sarah and George Northcutt. Now the thing about Gordon is that he had had an older brother who he never knew because his older brother died when he was about five years old. He had been the pride and joy of his parents. And when he died, they really didn't want any more kids. Now they did have a, a daughter already. Her name was Winifred. Now for most of Winifred's life, she had been an only child with just the memory of her older brother. When Gordon's mother, Sarah, found out that she was expecting again, Winifred was already like 17, 18 years old. It had been a long time. And she did not want this child. She hated the idea of having another kid. Now, I don't know if there were methods taken to try to terminate this or not, but it is said that she already despised this child. But when Gordon was actually born, all of a sudden she changed. She fell deeply in love with him. Like he was the apple of her eye. She wouldn't let him out of her sight. He was the golden child, okay? So Gordon grew up a little bit spoiled by his mom. But something about Gordon is, as in so many other cases that we've talked about, Gordon didn't quite fit the mold. He was very outgoing. He was very entertaining. He was a flashy dresser. He wasn't quite as masculine as other boys his age. In fact, when he was asked to do manual labor, he would always say he was going to be a great pianist and he had to protect his hands. Yeah. Wonder if I could use that as an excuse. When Gordon was a teenager, his family decided to move from Canada to California where they bought a farm. Well, this was great news for Gordon because he did not really, you know, fit in with his neighbors so much. So he figured that California was the place he ought to be. And he was probably right for a hot minute. So Gordon with his personality becomes, you know, really well liked. He did play the piano. He would go out to certain places, entertain people. The women really liked him. The men, eh, they tolerated him. Some liked him, but they all knew that he was different. So while Gordon was a big hit in the town and community with all of his, you know, exuberance and charisma, he became close with a friend named Claude. Now, I am so confused on this. I have heard some people say that Claude was a woman, and I have heard some people say that Claude was a man. I don't know. But Gordon and Claude became like this. Gordon would go over to Claude's family, have dinner, spend time with the other siblings, and this went on for a while. But then they noticed that Gordon kind of became fixated on Claude's younger brother. 
Now, the younger brother was about 13, I think, at the time. And times being what they were, and not being educated on predators like we are today, Gordon gradually convinced this younger brother to enter a kind of relationship, if you know what I mean. And the younger brother, although he was straight, he really didn't realize for some time that this was not okay and this was not normal. It wasn't consensual, but he didn't understand what was happening, basically. If nobody tells you you are very innocent in your head, and this is what happened. So gradually the family began to notice something ain't right here. And when they began questioning the younger brother and they found out what was happening, they had a hissy fit. Well, they get to the police and they have Gordon charged with assault of that kind. You know what I'm talking about. So Gordon actually had to spend some time in jail. He was found guilty. And oh my goodness, when the community found out, like they wanted nothing to do with him. So he was ostracized. That was the end of Gordon's entertainment business. So when Gordon got out of jail, strangely enough, he asked his father if he would buy him a piece of land up in Wineville. And he wanted to be a chicken farmer. Now, Gordon had never shown an interest in chickens or farming. He wouldn't help on his own dang farm because of, you know, delicate fingers. But his father says, okay, you know, if that's what you want to do, son. And so they go out and buy land and they build a house and chicken coops. And this is during the course of a summer. Now they're going to need some extra help. So Gordon calls his sister in Canada because she has a 13 year old son named Sanford. And he feels like he could give Sanford an opportunity to learn the chicken business and help build the house and work on the farm during the summer. So Winifred is like, yeah. I think that's good. She sends Sanford down to Wineville. It said that during these few months, everything was great. Gordon was fun. He was funny. He was a blast to be around. They built the house. They built the chicken coops. And then it was time for Sanford to go back to Canada. But this is where I have a problem. And this is just an assumption that Winifred did not know about Gordon's history with this other boy and being in jail. My guess is that his parents did not tell the rest of the family in Canada because remember they're in California, family in Canada, they don't have to know. I mean, I don't know what they say Gordon was doing. I would hope that she did not understand what had happened. Now, if she did, you have to think that she just thought he would never do this to his nephew. But boy, was she wrong. So after the summer, Gordon has to take Sanford back up to Canada. So when they get to Canada, Gordon talks to his sister Winifred and he insists that Sanford come back with him, that he's going to teach Sanford the whole chicken business. He's 13 years old. I mean, he's obviously on the brink of manhood and he needs to have a trade. So even though Sanford kept making every kind of excuse, he just really didn't want to go back. But Winifred was like, no, son, this is a great opportunity. This is going to set you up for life. So she tells Gordon, yes, you can take him back with you. But when they got back to the farm, everything that Sanford knew about Gordon changed. Without his dad there and just him and Sanford, he showed his true colors. First of all, Sanford was made to do everything. He did not put him in school like he promised Winifred he would because Sanford had to get up and, you know, tend to the chickens all day. He had to do all the farm work. He had to do all of the housework and cooking all the meals. Well, Gordon did nothing. But that wasn't the worst of it. Gordon would yell and berate him and physically hit him just because, I mean, Sanford didn't have to do anything that bad or wrong at all for Gordon to start hitting him. But then you can imagine what happens next. Gordon begins to abuse Sanford 
in the worst way, brutally and daily. You know, I don't go into the gory details. It's bad. It's really, really bad. And Sanford had physical problems that he would never get over because of this. After one of the times of abuse where Sanford was in so much pain, he could hardly walk. Gordon made him dig a big pit and he put Sanford in the pit. At this point, Sanford thought, okay, this is my grave. He's just going to go ahead and do away with me. So as Sanford is resting, Gordon comes with a pot of boiling hot water and pours it all over Sanford's back. And so he's got these horrific burns that are horrible scars for the rest of his life. Gordon puts him in the pit for several days with no food, no water. So you can see the level of abuse and rage that Gordon had. Well, as time passes, Sanford just becomes older, okay? Gordon liked his companions to be between the age of 8 and 12, somewhere in there. By now, Sanford is 15, and he's not that interesting to Gordon. But Gordon still wants to use and abuse him on the farm, you know, for the labor. Gordon would get in a car and make little mini trips from time to time. One day, Gordon comes back, and in the back of his truck, he's got this silver bucket. And he's grinning, and he's in a great mood, and he tells Sanford, look in the bucket. And Sanford is like, I don't know what I'm seeing here. It looked like a mass of hair, like maybe Gordon had run over an animal or whatever, and he didn't get it. And Gordon's like, look again. This time when Sanford really starts looking at it, he realizes it's a severed human head. Way to go, Gordon. Now, not only does he have this severed head, but he has got the body wrapped and put in the trunk of a car. So Sanford is horrified. He does not know who this person was. He doesn't know what to do. So Gordon is like, you know, they'll never be able to identify this body without a head. So he takes the body the next day over out into the desert area, close to a creek, bridge, something. Within a day, the neighbor went for a walk and finds this headless corpse and calls the police. And Gordon is right. They can't identify him. He takes the head and has Sanford start a fire and burn it and um, it, I don't think it burns all the way, but it is far enough away. Yeah. It was later determined that this was a Mexican national, probably illegal. We don't know. Um, I did read something that gave a name, but I don't, I don't know that they could ever really say who that was. It was just a big mystery. But Gordon was really excited because this is the first time he had ever committed murder. And he was euphoric. Sanford just felt like he would be next. Now what happens in the next couple months is debatable and kind of sketchy. What we do know, Gordon would have Sanford go on his little trips and find boys that were walking around without their parents or whatever and convince them to get in to the truck. And because Sanford was closer to their age, they trusted, you know, getting into the car thinking, okay, this guy wouldn't hurt me. There are multiple attempts that didn't go right that are documented, but we're going to talk about the ones that we know. In March of 1928, Gordon comes home with this little boy named Walter Collins. Now, Gordon would take these kids and lock them in the chicken coop so he could do anything that he wanted and they couldn't escape. But something happened when Walter was there. All of a sudden, his mother, Louise, shows up unexpected, uninvited. Well, when Sanford realizes Gordon's mom is there, Gordon is actually in the chicken coop with Walter. So Sanford thinks, finally, Somebody is going to stop this madness. 
So when she asked where Gordon was, he just, you know, kind of went over there. So Sarah Northcott walks in on Gordon and Walter, and she loses her mind. She is so upset. Now, this is the first time that she has ever berated Gordon. Like, he has not known his mother to be this way. But for hours, she's yelling and screaming, oh, my God, she, she's livid. And, you know, all this time, Gordon's crying, and he's saying, oh, I'll never do this again, Mom. Honey, Dad. Ever. But then Sarah realizes that they have a problem. Walter came from a neighborhood where Gordon used to work. He had a light job in a grocery store in that same neighborhood, so it is likely that he had known Walter several years ago before all the prison time and whatnot, which to me answers the question as to why Walter would get in a car with a stranger because he possibly was not a stranger. And he probably said, hey, you know, I'll take you wherever. Anyway, when Sarah realizes that Walter knows Gordon, she knows they cannot let this child leave because Gordon has already done the worst. And Gordon is facing prison again. So what she decides to do is absolutely diabolical. She gets Sanford and Gordon together and she says, well, there's only one solution to this problem. We have to get rid of Walter Collins, and if we all three do it, then we're all guilty, and we're all facing jail time, so I know nobody is going to rat out anybody else. It's going to be our secret and our bond. I mean, how sick do you have to be? So that is exactly what they do. Gordon distracts Walter for a second. Sarah comes up behind him, hits him in the head, but they all make sure that Walter Collins is gone. Now, you know, Gordon is swearing to his mom, I will never do this again, mommy, me. Whatever, you monster. I love you. But this promise that Gordon makes to Sarah does not last very long. Two months later, in May of 1928, Gordon's out on the hunt again. And this time he finds two boys that are brothers, Lewis and Nelson Winslow. And of course, he makes up some kind of crap story and he brings them to the chicken farm. And there they are in two separate coops. Now, the Winslow boys actually came from money. Like his family were pretty well off. And so now we have the disappearance of Walter and we've also got the Winslow brothers. So again, the public is livid. Now, we really don't know during this period of time how many boys visited the farm. Okay, so I want to read you the most ridiculous thing. Line my glasses. In the summer of 1928, Gordon visited the DA's office. I mean, can you imagine the nerve? Complaining about a neighbor's profane and violent behavior. The outburst reportedly upset his nephew who was training for the priesthood. Seriously? He was training by tending the chickens at age 15. Under investigation, the neighbor recalled seeing Gordon beat Clark on occasion, and he urged the detectives to find out what goes on at the Northcutts Ranch. I mean, the nerve. You're over here abusing and killing young boys, but yet you go to the DA's office and report your neighbor. To me, that is a special kind of narcissism and arrogance to think that you could actually get away with it. Although the police probably were gonna get around to investigating on neighbors' complaints, immigration gets there first. Because what happens during this time with Walter, the Winslows, and other missing boys, Winifred decides to come to visit the farm. She wants to see her son, Sanford, of course she does, and her brother, Gordon. So Winifred shows up and she notices something is very off. Sanford is very withdrawn. He doesn't really look at her in the eyes and Gordon will not let her 
and Sanford be alone together like ever. They can't have a private conversation. As you can imagine, during this time, the Winslow brothers met the same fate as Walter Collins and probably some others. But while Winifred was there, one night when Gordon went to sleep, Sanford woke Winifred up and told her to come outside. So when they get far enough from the house, Sanford all of a sudden spills everything and he tells Winifred exactly what's been going on about the murders, about the abuse of all kinds. Winifred now realizes her brother's a monster. She's afraid for her and Sanford. So she hatches the plan of, okay, let me go back to Canada and then I'll call the police. Which I guess I can understand because being from another country and making these accusations, I, I don't know. And the LAPD being what they were, I mean, who knows if, if she had gone directly to the police, whether it would have resulted in anything. And she could have been putting herself and Sanford in danger. I don't know. It, that's a hard call. But anyway, she goes back to Canada, she calls the, the police, and she reports an illegal immigration, okay? So she thinks that will get them out on the farm faster. And she is right, because the neighbor is telling the police that you should investigate. I've seen him abuse Sanford. Um, they, had, they just hadn't got around to it yet. I guess they were just busy. So anyway, when immigration gets out there, now we're at the period of time where... Sanford is stalling them. Gordon has now fled the house, but he told Sanford as he was leaving, you stall the police for at least two hours, or I am going to climb up a tree and shoot you. Well, even though that was probably unlikely, Sanford wasn't taking any chances. So here are the police are, realizing something's wrong. Sanford is acting all kind of nervous and squirrely, and then he starts spilling the beans. Well, the police at first are like, they could not wrap their mind around what this boy was telling them. So they want to see evidence. Well, they find several areas of blood soaked ground and the chicken coops were full of blood, which was probably a little bit excessive for chickens. Okay. And when Sanford told them where the actual bodies were that he had buried the Winslow brothers here and here and Walter Collins was over here. And since this had only been a few months, they should have still been kind of intact. When the police started digging, they only came across parts like fingers, bones, bones, some hair remnants, clothes, obviously, that were blood soaked. Um, and enough bone fragment that they realized these were human bones. And Sanford was confused because he said, I buried him whole. So the police surmised that at another time, Gordon probably went behind Sanford, dug up the bodies and put quicklime all over everything that would disintegrate the tissue and the bones very quickly. They did find a skull. And so they obviously knew that they had a serial murderer on their hands. So they take Sanford into custody. Now, Gordon had run and his mother had run, but they were quickly caught. They confessed to the murder of Walter Collins and the Winslow brothers, but then they were extradited to Canada. And while they were in Canada and they felt like they were safe, they were canned. But then they were sent back to California where they confessed again. Well, you can't really get out of it. At least Gordon couldn't because they found all these bones and they had a star witness, Sanford Clark, saying this is what had happened. Of course, corroboration from the neighbors saying we knew he was abusing the boy. And they kind of did see boys come and go or just come and disappear. But nobody said anything because in 1928, I guess people wanted to mind their own business. When it comes time for trial and people are horrified, the public is horrified. They can't wrap their minds around this. This is not something that happens. Gordon Northcott was a hated man. Now, while he's in jail, his mom starts to kind of talk crazy. She says, um, well, Gordon is not his dad's son. Actually, he is European royalty. It was an affair that I had with somebody. 
Royal, which was, of course, absolute horse feathers. But then Gordon started talking, and he said that he had been abused sexually by his dad from the time that he was 10 years old, at which point his mom confessed that Gordon was not actually her son, that he was the product of a relationship between her husband and his daughter, which was Gordon's mom, Winifred. And I, I'll just be honest with you, that to me, that was never proven or disproven as far as I know, but um, that honestly makes more sense because she was already a grown adult when Gordon was born. And um, let's just be honest, for all of his problems, um, sexual orientation does not make you an abuser. Gordon obviously had a lot of rage in the way that he abused not only Sanford, but these other boys. He delighted in this sadistic behavior. And certainly murder is not normal, okay? So, you know, Gordon said later he was abused by, you know, other people, his dad and his uncle, and then his mom said he was abused by all of his family. I don't know. I honestly do believe that Gordon was abused growing up because I, I don't see this behavior coming from someone who had a wonderful, normal childhood. I mean, maybe there can be aberrations, but I believe that Gordon was a victim himself which does not excuse his behavior, does not excuse the fact that he was a monster, but I feel like he was made, you know, unfortunately, like so many people are. Now, here's the thing. They go to trial. Gordon is such a showman, and if you ever read interviews where he's talking to the press, I mean, it's like he's a star, and he's trying to be funny, and he's trying to be amusing, and charismatic and I mean it was horrifying it was it was like watching a train wreck and Gordon also becomes convinced that his attorneys cannot really represent him and his feelings and his motives and understanding what actually happened so what does Gordon do well he has a stroke of brilliance like a lot of other people he decides to be his own attorney yeah well you can imagine that was just a dog and pony show. It was ridiculous. He was ridiculous. Um, obviously, the jury finds him guilty. He had tried to use the insanity plea, which I don't even know. I'm not sure he wasn't insane. But he was held responsible for the murders of the Winslow brothers and the unidentified Mexican. Now, his mother, Sarah, was put on trial, and she was found guilty of the murder of Walter Collins. But now they could never identify his body. They did find some clothes of Walter's that were bloody. She said she, you know, killed Walter. Now, Sanford was also in the mix. He's the one that, you know, blew the whole lid off this thing. Sanford was tried and found not guilty. Well, in 1929, Gordon Northcott was found guilty of murder and sentenced to be hanged. Now his mother, although she was found guilty, the judge felt like, oh, we can't execute her because she's a woman, which I think is a load of crap, but you know, whatever. She got life in prison and she, I've heard different things. She either spent 12 years or 14 years and then she was let out. And you know, some people say she died in prison. Some people said she got out after 12 years and lived, you know, for two more years and then she passed away. I don't know. Uh, definitely, I don't think her sentence was harsh enough, but that's just my opinion. Now, Gordon, while he was in jail, he had never confessed to the murder of Walter Collins. And so, Christine was just not 100% convinced that he was guilty. And she felt like Walter might still be alive. She was having hope. So before the day before his execution, Gordon called Christine and said if she came up to see him in prison, then he would tell her the truth of what happened. Well, that was a load of you-know-what. Christine does get up there and see him, but Gordon 
I think as a last act of narcissistic revenge, maybe, he just decides um, he's not going to say anything. So she just wants an answer, but he will not talk to her. And he never says whether he did it or not. The only thing that he was, had ever said is, I didn't kill your son. Now, his mom, Sarah, and Sanford is saying, yeah, that was Walter Collins we killed. So it is October 2nd, 1930, when Gordon faces the hangman's noose. At this point, he reverted to complete fear. They had to force him up the steps. He begged and pleaded with the audience to please say a prayer for him. He said he made peace with God. I hope he did. I really do. At, at, the, bottom, at the end of the day, I hope that he really did. It is said that his last words looking at the noose were, don't, don't. Now, as a side note, the rope was not tight enough. So it had too much slack. When they dropped the rope, it didn't break his neck like it was supposed to. Um, he actually took 13 minutes to pass away. So, uh, you know, that was a quite horrific end for him. Do I feel sorry for him? No, I don't. Um, like I said, I know it's weird. I, I say I, I'm, I hope he made his peace with God. Do I still think he, you know... I don't know. It's it's hard because, you know, I feel like he was abused too, but I really I really don't have any sympathy for child killers. Okay? So, what happened after all of this? Well, let's talk about the Reverend Gustav. He continued with his radio show like for the rest of his days, he just hammered against the LAPD, exposing corruption. Um, he was a Big, gigantic pain in their rear ends. Arthur Hutchins, this is interesting, he goes on to sell concessions at a carnival. He gets married, has a family, and, I mean, it, it kind of sounded like he had that, you know, kind of personality. He later became a horse trainer and a jockey in California. So, I mean, I, you know, I guess he was kind of living the dream. His kids thought he hung the moon. And it sounds like he was quite a personality. I don't think we can be too upset about a kid who doesn't really understand the situation and just sees an opportunity. He went on to live a good life. Now, Sanford, after he was found not guilty of murder, um, they said it was really self-defense because it was true that Gordon had said, if you don't participate in these murders and abductions and whatever, then I'm going to kill you. And Sanford knew that he absolutely would. So Sanford was sent for five years to a boys' reformatory school, which he probably needed to catch up. And I don't know, it was, it was probably a safe place for him. He gets out. Um, he actually fights in World War II. He's a veteran. He comes back. He gets married. He works for the Postal Service for 28 years, was a model citizen involved in lots of civic clubs, events, whatever. But... Here is the sad part. He had physical problems from his abuse that just did not go away. He was maimed, pretty much, um, from the abuse and had to live with that for the rest of his life. He also decided not to have children biologically because he was afraid of whatever gene ran in that family, he was afraid that he would pass it on to his kids. It said that he suffered from what we would now call PTSD, and he had trouble sleeping, he had bouts of depression, and he always bore the guilt for the rest of his life of his part in those murders. I think today we would have been able to help and treat him with therapy, and I don't feel like Sanford was guilty at all. He was very loved by his family. He was a, apparently a great person. I cannot imagine having to live with something like that on your conscience. Christine Collins never gave up the hope that Walter was out there somewhere because years later, I, I believe it was one of the it was one of the boys that had been abducted at some point was found. He came back to home five years later and said he had escaped the chicken coop, but because of what had happened, the abuse, he didn't want to talk about it. He was. He was afraid he was in trouble. He was horrified to have to tell the story, so he stayed away. But then eventually he came back to his home. Because of that, Christine had the hope that maybe 
Walter did not pass away out there. And maybe Walter was out there somewhere. So for 39 years, she kept looking and hoping that Walter would return. Um, she died in Los Angeles at the age of 75. Christine also sued the police department and J.J. Jones for what they had done to her. She won that lawsuit for $10,800, which doesn't sound like much, but back in 19, you know, in the 1930s, it was a big deal. Um, however, that was never paid. Mr. Jones, he was temporarily suspended, but then he was reinstated because, you know, I guess he was one of the good old boys club. And once you're part of the LAPD corruption, I guess, you know, you're there for life, whatever. Um, she never got paid, which I, I think is horrendous. Now, for the town of Wineville, these murders were so infamous and so horrific and nationwide, I, you know, everybody knew they were embarrassed to be known. Like, you didn't know Wineville for anything else. Like, it was just a spot in the road. But everybody knew it because of the murders, so they wanted to change that. Wineville actually changed their name to Miraloma, which is what it is today. Um, the chicken coop house still stands, and my understanding is from the last time it was sold, the, the new owners never knew. Like, they didn't know what happened there. It's in a subdivision now. Like, there's a lot of houses and businesses and stuff around, but you can find uh, this house on the internet. Um, it's privately owned. You can't really visit it. You can drive by it. I saw a documentary a few years ago um, where the people there said that they had no idea why, but they knew the house was haunted. Like the doors would rattle and lights on and off and they would see figures. It was, it, that's the best of my recollection. Um, but yeah, until somebody told them, hey, did you know this house is uh, used to belong to Gordon Northcott and this is what he did? They had no idea because you don't have to disclose that thing, I guess, after so much time. Imagine buying a house and then finding out it was infamous. So anyway, that's the end of the Wineville Chicken Coop Murders. I hope you enjoyed this story. It is horrifying. I hope you all are enjoying the holidays. You had a great Thanksgiving. I will see you next week. Tell me below. Next week, do you want to see paranormal or do you want to see crime? We can do either. There's tons of stories out there. In the meantime, whatever you do, stay silky.